Right, okay, the first question then was this. Quite a simple question, and you, there's nothing to stop them doing another question similar to this with file sizes and stuff. They're testing, can you put together like maths expressions, basically. Um, but with all of these things, all of these algorithms, even if you don't really know how you're going to do the main part, there's always easy wins on these things. So let's just look at this question. It says um, they want a, a program to calculate file size in bytes. It's going to ask the user to input the file size in megabytes, and then it's going to calculate and output the number of bytes this represents in a user-friendly format. Whenever we're doing output, always think, don't just output a number or a piece of text. A message is what you should be going for. So they're testing a couple of things there, that you can format something and that you can use concatenation. You know the bit where we join text and values together? Okay, so concatenation. But there is an easy win on this. They've asked you to write a program that inputs. So let's do some input. So in pseudocode, we tend to use input, a function. So when you're doing input, it's important that what you do is you indicate to the user what you want them to do. Back in the old days of computing, you used to just have a flashing cursor. That was your interface to the computer. Okay? If you're writing a program, tell your user what you want. So it's important to say, right, okay, input. So we'll give a parameter to the input function, some data for it to display when it does its input job. Any text, literal text, has to be in double quotes. Don't forget that. You're better than the year 10s at that. You tend to sort of do that. The year 10s sort of don't do that. They need to learn to do that. So any literal text in double quotes. So I'll, I could put a massive long sentence, but I'm just going to say file size. And this is the bit where you've got to read the question. So we're going to input the file size in megabytes. So let's make sure we say that. Close off the text with a double quote. If I'm going to do input, I want that input to go somewhere, so I need to store it. So I need a store operation that equals. And then I need to store it somewhere sensible. A lot of you <coughs> did actually put sensible names down. So I'm just going to call it M bytes, megabytes. <coughs> okay, you could have had file MB or some, something sensible. Don't just call it like X. Always give it a sensible name. You're trying to give the person reading this the best chance of giving you all the marks. Anything weird and unusual, chances are you're going to start misidentifying stuff. Right, so that's, that's an easy bit. On the mark scheme, that was two marks worth. Doing the input and storing it somewhere. They were a bit generous, I thought, there. <coughs> but that's, that's how it was. Some of you did this. Python. Okay, casting. So you, you've identified that we want a number so you've said, oh, when we do input, that's text, because it's from a keyboard. Fine, it is. But we're doing pseudocode. Depends on the language. If we was doing you use this, I was getting quite specific. <coughs> We might write it like that. And we have to put a semicolon in as well. They look different. But they're doing identical jobs. We're not worried about that. Pseudocode is not designed to say this is how you do it, saying this is what you need to do. All we're doing, all these algorithm questions, you're translating from some written text 
into something a little bit more formal that a coder could easily then implement. You'd have to be pretty rubbish not be able to implement this. You wouldn't last long as a programmer. Right, so we've got the meat of the question now is to do this calculation. So they're testing a couple of different things. They're testing that you know the relationship between megabytes, bytes, kilobytes, gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, all that stuff. You know the stuff you've been doing since year seven? Okay. No calculators for these exams. So we've got to be savvy about what we do. You could, if you're some sort of calculating bod, work it out in your head. All right? It's all you did. Right, yeah? I'm not being offensive by saying you're a bod, so that's very clever. I cannot do mental arithmetic personally. A lot of my programs are littered with calculations for the translator to do for me. So, to convert between megabytes to bytes, what's the difference between a byte and a megabyte? Right. A, a thousand... Oh, God, that pen's not good. A thousand and twenty-four is the number of bytes in a kilobyte. In a megabyte, how many is it? Another 1,024. So, instead of trying to be really clever and working out what 1,024 times 1,024 is, uh, let's get the computer to do it by writing that. Just write that, don't you? So, we've got a value in megabytes. It's roughly a million times bigger, isn't it? So I'm going to do the value I've been given <laughs> turn it into kilobytes, turn it into megabytes. Okay? I need to store that somewhere. So I'll put my storage operator and I come up with a, a name. Some of you again Came up with a sensible name like bytes, but he could have called it anything. But we're trying to make this clear to the examiner. Right, the final bit of this algorithm is to do the output, which in pseudocode, loads of different ways you can put output, but we tend to do print. Print and input are coming from Python, we know that. Okay? It's a function again. So you pass the data you want to print inside the parentheses. So that's important to remember. We pass a parameter to the print function. So I want to do a meaningful message. They even gave us an example. So let's copy their example. Their example was there are 524288 bytes in 5 megabytes. Right. So I need a bit of text, then the value in bytes, Another bit of text, and then the value that we were given. So, a bit of text, double quotes around it. There are. Always go. This is about the context of the question. Always go with what they're giving you. We then need to concatenate the value that we calculated for the number of bytes. So, we can do that by doing a plus. You can put an ampersand if you want. Pluses. Fine. It's pseudocode. The key bit is that the examiner can see that you've got the logic right. Oh, you're joining some text with a variable. Fine. Now we need to get the right variable. So the number of bytes we just calculated, that's in bytes. And then I say, right, following that, concatenate it with another bit of text. And that other bit of text was bytes in. So it can look confusing, but the important thing is that you're clear. Scrabbly handwriting's not going to cut it when you come to writing pseudocode out. Right, so we then want the number of megabytes that was originally entered. That was our line from our input. 
And then they add at the end MB. So I'm going to put that on. I'm going to fully do what they ask. Right. At the end of the day, that was actually question one. It was a few bits in on the paper. Not a very hard question. Lots of easy wins on that. Okay, that's the important thing. Easy wins. Even if you couldn't do this bit, there was other marks to get. The only time where you have to do that int thing is if they tell you to cast the number. Okay, so let's say they asked you to do some input and they wanted a, a real number, a floating point number. You'd just use the float. You'd say float. And it's a function, so you give it a value and it converts it for you. So I could just say float input. And that would give me a floating point value. Okay? If you've got a number and you need to turn it into text, what do we put? As a cast. Yeah, string, str. So str5 would give me that. Five. Not really a computer science question, I don't think so. It's more a maths question. Okay? Right, okay, moving on. Right, the next Cody question. Uh, I will just say, let me just pause the video. Oh, I can't pause the video. That, um, that weird one with the packet switching, one of the answers didn't make sense. It, it was like a bit woolly and vague. Yeah. The C, I think it was. It was like, what does that even mean? Um, but most people went about that the right way and like went, well, logically, the other things come first. Oh, I've ended up with C last. Just stick it into the bottom. You might get questions like that. So you've got to think logically. If you've got answers that don't make sense, just ignore them to start with. Right, okay, so moving on. Oh, I want to just go over that SQL one, actually, as well, before that, yeah. There's two, there's two bits in the second paper at the back. Right, <clears throat> the SQL question. There's nothing hard about the SQL. Apart from spelling it, when you're short, you can't write the top of the board, are you? Right, SQL, Structured Query Language. A language designed for end users, managers to use, not programmers, theoretically. Which is true until you try and do something really nice and complicated in SQL, and then it gets really horrendous. But in general, yes, you can throw together simple queries. For our purposes, you'll do a lot more of this in um, a level, but for our purposes, we need to know how to retrieve data. The thing that cocked a lot of people up with this question was not using the names of things that were given. So in this question, they said we had a data table. Uh, about students and it recorded all these things and it had some uh, field names, student name, detail, points, letter sent. Okay. Um, the table was called uh, conduct and it said that in the question, he put it in bold. He said, stored in a database table called conduct. Write an SQL statement. So there are four elements to an SQL statement. This is all you've got to remember, guys. The first bit, and when I'm doing these, I tend to always put the keywords in capitals. You don't have to, but I tend to do that because it then separates it. Select says, retrieve me some stuff. And on the select line, 
I put the data I want. So I have to read the question. There was a further bit to this, and it said, what is a, a wild card? So if I was to put select star, that would retrieve all the items of data. OK? But we tend to, with large databases, you don't want to be doing that because you'd be generating too much data. So we'll be specific. So it said, write an SQL statement to select the student name. So, OK, let's have student name, which was spelt like that. Anyone know what the correct name is for writing names of things like that, where you do capital letters each time? Starts with a capital letter, and then every word subsequent has a capital letter, so you can read it with no spaces. Yeah, some people call it that. It's called Pascal casing, from the language Pascal. They insisted you wrote certain things that way. There is another one, another casing format, where you might write a student name like that. That's called camel casing, because it has a hump in the middle. Yeah, another lame computer science joke. Whatever you read in the question, use how they formatted it. Okay? <laughs> They've done it for a reason, just copy them. Right, it wants just the names. So that's the select statement. If I needed any other data, if I wanted to know how many points they had, I'd just say comma and points. Okay, but it didn't ask in this question, it just wanted the name. Just want a list of student names, basically. Um, for all the records that have negative points. So we need to say where we're taking it from. And that's the key thing. Where is it coming from? So we use the keyword from. We were told what the table was. The table was called conduct. So we say, and you can read it, it reads like English. This is why it's been designed this way. So select the student name from conduct. And we want to put conditions on it. So where is certain condition? And the keyword is where. And they told us the condition, anyone that's got negative points. Right, OK. So you can't like say negative points. How do we detect that a value is negative? Less than zero. They're asking you to think a little bit. So the field, and I'll just double check, was called points with a capital P. So I'm going to say where points is less than zero. What else could you have put? There's a couple of different ways you can write the same thing. What, how else could I say less than zero? <coughs> For whole numbers, obviously. What if I wrote this? You can always write these a couple of different ways. Again, doesn't matter. I think they're asking if it did mention that one, actually. Um, as long as it, the logic is clear, that's all we care about. Right, that was all you needed to answer that question. But there is one more <coughs> clause that you can put in a select query, and that is order by. What do you think order by is for? Sorting. And it's got a simple format. You say, what field, what order you want to sort it. If you want to then, like, let's say normally with names you'd do um, sort on surname and then sort on full name after that. So in this case, they've just got student name, which is really bad in a database, to be fair. You wouldn't have a database like that. So you put either ASC for ascending sort or desk for descending sort. So if you wanted to sort on who's got the most points, you know like you do rewards assemblies and it's like the person at the top, you go, oh, look at it again. Um, so you might say points descending, biggest first. And then if you've got two competing students for the worst student of the year, you might then put their student name in alphabetical order. They might do something like that. Okay, that is all you need to remember about. 
This can get more complicated, just like when we're programming with if, you can put and and or and things like that, if you've got multiple conditions. But that's it. That's SQL. <clears throat> you get a database question where they're asking about SQL, it is a go-to question. Because it won't be mega hard. It's basically a simplified form of programming. Because it, it is a language. Okay, right. Moving on. So the next programming question... Oh, was the array one, wasn't it? Right. This, this was a bit toshy from everybody, this one. Toshy means rubbish, by the way. Um, <clears throat> right. It's carrying on with this database, and it was the database table is read into an array. An array of records. <clears throat> and they put each piece of data, and you can see they've like turned it all into text, because it's in double quotes. It's all text. Uh, a zero-faced array. Remember, that's in general, all the questions are going to be like that. So the first item in the array, and what I would have done on this question, I'd have written down the indexes. I've told you that. When you've got an array question, write the indexes onto the paper. So under Kirsty, I would have put zero. Under homework forgotten, I would have put a one. Under minus two, I would have put a two, just to confuse me. And under false, I would have put three. Remember, the thing about zero based is if you've got four items, then the last index is one less than that. Zero, one, two, three. That's why writing it <coughs> down is a good idea. Then you won't make, lose a mark because you've got the wrong number. Right, <clears throat> they even give you an example, which is very kind of them. And they said that if you put student data zero, that'll give you Kirsty. Right, so the, the question then said, okay, bearing in mind all that data, write an algorithm that will identify whether the data in student data array <clears throat> shows that a letter has been sent home or not for the student. The algorithm should then output either sent, if it has been sent, or not sent, if a letter has not been sent. Right. So they're telling us what the output should be. So it is just a lookup task. Okay. So the key thing they're checking, it wasn't worth many marks this, but they're checking that you can refer to an element in an array. Yeah? Which they expect you to be able to do. We use that for all the algorithms that do search and sort, and we're always looking for items in an array. So they're saying, well, can you do that then? So we're looking to see whether a letter's been sent. So the final item in the array at position three is whether a letter got sent. Isn't it? And it's in text format. So all we need to do is an if, don't we? If all we're doing, it says an algorithm, so we haven't got to write a function, we haven't got to write a procedure, we've just got to write some pseudocode. So we're just going to write if, and then we need to refer to the array, so we put the name of the array. Oh, this pen's not good now. Right, which is written all in lowercase. Right, that's the name of the array one access. To specify the element in square brackets, we put the element number. So we want the thing at the end. So that was no one, two, three. That's what we're going to look up. So remember what that means, it's like a variable, but it's a variable with a list of data attached to it. That's how you can think of an array. So we say, right, that array, that position in it. Retrieve that value, and we want to compare it. We want to know whether it is, tend to put the double equals, although you could probably get away with equals in pseudocode, but we just tend to do that. We want to compare it to true or false. 
They had it in text format. So we need to compare with the text version. It's all in uppercase. So I've got an example there. I'm going to use theirs. So I'm going to check to see if it was false. So I'm saying if the thing at that position is equal to the text false, then that means a letter was not sent. So I've got to get the logic the way around. So I'm going to output, so I can say, right, if that was true, print, not sent. I'm not looking at the mark scheme, by the way. I'm only looking at the question. OK. Print, not sent. What have I done there that's really important? Indent. I'm showing that this is the block of code if this is true. Right, I have only got a binary choice here. So if I don't find that to be true, I just do an else. And say, right, well, yeah, if it was not false, then I'm going to assume that it was true. Unless there's something terribly nasty gone wrong with the database. That was it. It would not have been wrong. It wouldn't have been very efficient, but it would not have been wrong <coughs> to have written this. But why would you? Assuming it's going to be in caps again. So you could have sent, you could have done that, okay? But actually, we didn't need to. It's a binary choice. You only need to do another if, or do else if, or something like that, or elif if you want to do that, if you've got more than one choice to make. If you do like a grade boundaries question. Again, not hard, but what they're testing there, they're going. Right, OK, you've done algorithm work. You've looked at arrays. You know about indexes of arrays. Show us you can actually do that. That's quite a nice, easy question. Nice, easy four marks, really. If you got the logic wrong, you threw away two sets of marks. If you got the, if you said seven when you meant not seven. Right, and then... <coughs> it, it was nice... Most people did get that a function and procedure are different because a function returns a value. What some people did, and I will say about that one, some people said a procedure doesn't always return a value. <laughs> Just say a procedure doesn't return a value, a function does. That's it. Don't overcomplicate it. That's a generalisation. In languages, there are lots of ways of returning values. Okay, but we're not getting into that. The, uh, <coughs> the ASCII and extended ASCII was hilarious. There were some really good answers to that and then some really tragic ones. Right. ASCII is a 7-bit code. That's what you can talk about. 128 different characters you can represent. Extended ASCII, one more bit. 8-bit code, 256. It allows you to represent more funny characters like accented European characters like the dot-dot characters and the... I don't know any... Um, European languages isn't my thing. Language isn't my thing. <clears throat> but it lets you represent more symbols. Okay? So it's more useful. But it takes sort of an extra bit. But be, just be careful when you answer them and you're not waffling. Okay, the last question then. <coughs> Open my pen keeps going long enough. Right, this was a biggie. But there were, again, easy wins on this one. Right, a voting application. Write an algorithm that. And they've, they've given you, in English, four bullet points to cover. Allows voters to enter A, B, or C. That sounds like input code to me. OK, so let's keep that in my head. Keeps track of how many times each candidate has been voted for. That's a tally program problem. A running total. We talked about those. 
As soon as one person has finished voting, it allows the next person to vote. Right, so the, we're going to do a vote and then another vote. What is that indicating? A loop of some description. I don't know how I'm going to do the loop yet. I'm not worried about that. But yeah, there's a loop. So when I, if I was doing this question, I would just make a little mark. Just say, like, oh, running total. Input. Just write some stuff next to those bullet points. The bullet point questions are the easiest to an answer because they've broken it down for you already. They've done the decomposition. <coughs> right, and it says, at any point, allows the official to type end, which will print out the number of votes for each candidate and, and this is the crucial bit that a few people missed, the total number of votes overall. That last bit is telling you that we need to keep track of all the votes that have been cast. There are a couple of ways of doing that, but that's what we've got to keep in our mind. Right, so we need to keep track of how many A, B's and C's on our running total. If we're doing a running total, we need to initialise values. There are very clever ways of doing this. You wouldn't do it like this normally. But we're not interested in clever ways. You could do it with a race. Okay? We're keeping it simple. I will get a mark for doing that. Initialization. If you've ever got a problem that sounds like a running total, initialize. We need some input code. So we need to ask the user to input their vote. So I'm going to do this here in Indenti. I know what I'm going to do in my head. But I'm just going to say, OK, vote equals. And I need to give a message to the user. This is a really poor system, by the way. <coughs> because at any point, someone can type end and finish the voting. Can't they? What's to stop the user typing end? That is poor. You wouldn't do it though. You have to have some sort of authentication. You know, like if you're at a till and they have to do something to the till, someone has to put their swipe their card or code number. So a bit now. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Right, so <coughs> specifically. I'm not going to tell the user that if they type end, it will quit the program. So I'm not going to do that. So I've collected the vote. All I've then got to do is interrogate, examine this value. I'll need to do an if. So I'm going to say if vote equals A, what have I got to be careful of when I'm doing comparison with text? Yeah, uppercase or lowercase. <coughs> it doesn't mention that here, but always be aware of that. How could we do it in this case? Yeah. Yeah, I do something like that. Or even you could just say. When we get the input, I turn the input into uppercase and then I have to keep putting dot upper loads of times, which is what I'm going to do. All right? But the other way to do it would have been to do this. Could have done it that way as well. Okay? But let's keep it simple. Right. So if that, <coughs> is that the case? Right, sorry about this, people watching this video. Reese, are you paying any attention? That's all coming up on the video, thanks guys. So it just shows your respect, thanks. So disrespectful, but hey. Right. If I voted for A, I've identified that. 
You can write this a number of different ways, as long as you're clear. That is the old school way of writing it. You could happen. Do that as long as it's clear. I would argue <coughs> for the preference being that. So that the person at the other end gets the best chance of saying, oh yeah, okay, you've incremented. <coughs> right, that's if it was vote eight. I've still got to decide whether it was B or C. So this is a case where I've got a non-binary choice. So I'm just going to say else if and do another test. Okay, I could put double equals there, but it's pseudocode, and the intent is I'm comparing. I'm doing an if. Right, so if it's both B, then I can do B equals B plus 1. If it wasn't both B, what logically could it be? Could be C. What about this cancelling it with N? I don't want N to force it to be voted as votes for C. So I'm actually going to do this. And check. So that I make sure that if I type end, that would give me a vote for C if I didn't do that. <coughs> I could put end, end if. I don't have to put that. Pseudo code. As long as the logic is clear. So that's going to do my voting. What about this, the overall total? What way could I do that? Yeah, I could do it at the end, couldn't I? Yeah? I would overcomplicate this. Some people did this. They went, oh, total equals total plus one each time. No need to. Just add up the votes you've cast. <coughs> right, so the only other bit I've got to do, I've got to put the loop in place, but I want to do the total, so I'm going to do the print out at the end. So I, I, I still don't know how to do the loop. But I am accessing lots of marks here because I'm doing the input code, I'm doing the tallying code, do the reset, and I'm now going to do my output. And it's just a concatenation exercise again. So I've got A, and it can look a bit weird depending on what you've called your variables. And I'm going to put a little colon in there so that it's got like a colon and then a number and then a bit of a space. Just so it's a bit more clear to the output. And then the total, I could do it on separate lines. I'll do it on separate lines to make it nice. So the total So I was going to say total votes, and that could just be, and I'm going to put it in brackets. Just add up A, B, and C. That'll give me the total votes. So the only bit I haven't worked out is the, the loop bit. Right, I've got this issue. <coughs> That's obviously the end of my loop, so I'm going to put loop. Because I'm going to repeat this over and over again. Okay. <coughs> I could have a while loop. Oh, pen. Useless pen. I could have a while loop. What do I put on a while loop? <laughs> I need a condition. Yeah, I need a condition that while it's true, we'll keep the loop happening. What am I testing? I want to test what they typed in. I haven't typed anything in yet. <clears throat> so in order for that to work, I'd have to mess about with how I've written this. But there is a different type of loop. <coughs> a loop that happens at least once. It's called a repeat until. And this is the, in this case, if you were asking someone to enter a password, you could use the same loop. Where you say, right, oh, do some stuff, and then we'll test at the bottom. And say, like, okay. Repeat until, and it actually works quite logically in an Englishy way. So say, repeat this until 
Both equals, and what was it? End or something. So if both didn't equal end, let's go back round, do it again. And that's it. <clears throat> so the way I tackled that, I didn't try and work out what the whole program was going to be. What I've done is I've gone, right, what are the obvious bits? Yeah, there's some weird stuff going on here, and I've got to try and remember to do a loop. If I was going to do the while loop, I'll change that in a minute, and I could have put it doing it. But I've identified that I wanted this to happen at least once. I thought, I'll repeat until. If I don't know whether it needs to happen at all, a while loop. If it's a fixed number of times, a for loop. Okay, they're the loop structures that you need. Right, so just to rejig this so that you can use a while loop. The while loop uses like a guard value. So I might say while vote is not equal to n. So I can use exclamation mark equals. You can do that symbol not equal to if you're completely stuck and you can't remember what the sim symbol is, it's pseudocode, so there's nothing to stop you saying not equal to. Because it's pseudocode. Nothing to stop you doing that. In order for you to test vote, vote needs a value. So we need to make sure we ask, and you often see this in um, code, You ask them for the input first. So I can put end in straight away and it just comes straight out. But before we loop, if we do that system, we need to get the next vote. So the last line of the code will need to be a repeat of that. Logically identical to the repeat until version just tipped round a little bit and a little bit more clunky to implement in this case. You should not fear the algorithm questions. There's always stuff that's going to let you access marks. That is the overriding... How many people missed a question out? If you missed a question out, you can guarantee that you won't access any marks to that question. That's, that's just a given. If in doubt, intelligent guess. You should never leave a question blank. You would be surprised. Written questions are the hardest ones, but sometimes it might be that I don't know anything. But just try and put something intelligent down. Something in context. Got a chance. Right, I'll start that video. Oh no, it's screwed up. Can it screw up?